Okay. 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 I could choose that one back there. So I'll try to talk loud. If I'm not being loud enough, give me like a, this little guy, a little thumbs up. But don't just leave it there. Like, give me the movement. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Leah Wise, and I get to speak to you tonight to finish the generational worship sessions. And we will get started. We're going to talk about the new song today. We're going to talk a little bit on the prophetic in song. Um, and then we're going to spend a lot of our time on the Holy of Holies, that place in worship and intimacy. So, um, as always, if you have like a thought, a question, um, something that you want to discuss that relates to what we're talking about, like please don't hesitate to, to speak up or raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to it. I like some interaction. Um, and I don't, I don't know it all. So, <laughs> I am also to learning. I'm up for learning more. So. All right, I'm going to start us in prayer. Okay, Jesus, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you for your spirit that is within us. When we said yes to you, that you made us your dwelling place. And I pray, God, that you will be glorified in our midst today through our conversation. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come with fresh revelation to each and every one of us for the thing that we need. We thank you that your word is living and active. I pray that you would breathe a fresh breath upon every single person in here. That they'd be stirred to want to go deeper and deeper with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So in scripture, um, if you were to look up the phrase new song, to sing a new song, um, you would find that less than a couple handfuls of times. And most of the time you're going to see that in the Psalms. Um <clears throat> So, for example, if we go to Psalm 33.3, this is really, it's, it, you can turn there if you want, you don't have to. Um, but it's a psalm, basically a celebration. A lot of the psalms that this is in, whatever it says, sing to him a new song, um, they're usually a song to testifying and to praising him for who he is and what he has done. And the people of Israel, the Hebrews, are being encouraged to sing a new song. Think about what you know about God. Think about what he's done for you and for um, all your ancestors before you. And sing him a new song. Now, when you look up the word new in the Strong's Concordance, it's not like something uber deep other than it says fresh. So you're going to do It's a fresh, it's a new sing. So you are singing to him a new, fresh, on-the-spot song. It's something that has never been sung before or maybe not in the exact tone or, in the, in, or all in the exact words. It wasn't a written psalm already. It's just something on the spot. It should be an overflow of your heart to the Lord. That's it, a new psalm. Um, so like I said, in Psalm 33, 3, this is a celebration. So he's singing, like, with joy, with excitement, with praise, give God something new. And there's, like, no pressure on it. You know, like, back, I don't know, sometimes we think, um... Well, if I have to write, like, a new song, does it have to have, like, a verse in the chorus? No. It might be one line, and you repeat it over and over again. Maybe that's what God's put on your heart. Maybe that's what he's showing you. Maybe God show you, showed you that he was your redeemer this week, and so you just sing that to him over and over, and the more that you repeat it, maybe he gives you um, more words to sing to him. So, um, if that makes sense, does anyone have anything on the new song? <laughs> All right, I read a lot about it, but I don't really feel like we should stick there, so I'm a feeler, so we're just going to go with what I feel. Um, Sorry, ignore me. Okay. Oh, did you find one? Okay. I'm not loud enough. Okay. All right. You need a few from the back or safe. They're safe now. <laughs> no pressure. We're not going to tell Josh, so he'll keep his mouth shut. <laughs> I like that it says, I like that that verse says, play 
skillfully mm-hmm. and to shout. And yeah. so it's kind of like, mm-hmm. it's, it's all of it, right? We're supposed to shout within the song and play. It's like, yeah. I that because that's, I wish I would have known this when I worked with a guy who was kind of piano only, hymns mm-hmm. only, and I was kind of like, and it was created in 1699 or something. So for 1,700 years, how, what did they do? Yeah. You know, and so I like that because it's played skillfully. It, 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 it entails that there's, you know, music with the song. Yeah, definitely. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I love that too. Um, so in Exodus 15, Carol hit on in her class that... Um, in Exodus 15, we see that Moses probably gave us our first worship song after they had been delivered um, from Egypt. There's a song that it said that Moses and the people sang. And it's definitely different than the way our str- that our songs are structured today. <laughs> um, but I love this, too, because it says that after they sing the song, Miriam, his sister, who was, who was, a, who was a prophetess, she didn't, she didn't use the exact phrase, sing a new song, but she said... Um, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider he has hurled into the sea. And I, I imagine if, if there's this long song sung, and they had just been delivered, they didn't have probably a lot of written songs. Maybe that was it. And maybe it was being written in the moment. And yet she's still encouraging them to keep singing unto the Lord for what he has just done for you. That means that everyone had a different... They had a, maybe a slightly different perspective than, than the next person, but it was all unified in the whole thing of that they were all delivered. And they saw mighty, crazy acts of God in that, right? So we see the new song even way before the Psalms. Um, I like in Psalm 43, 40, verse 3. Um, I'm just going to read the first few verses. So this is a Psalm of David. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. The rest of that Psalm is really good, but I just wanted to hit on those first few verses. Because what we're seeing here is that David said, I was in a horrible place and I waited on God and he heard me and he shifted. He like heard me, he delivered me, he took me out and he shifted my perspective and he put a new song in my mouth. Now David could have kept that to himself, right? But he, we see multiple times in the Psalms that David gave those songs to the Lord these are, a lot of these are David's new songs <laughs> that he sang from life. So our new song, again, comes from who we know God to be, how we've encountered him in the last week, how we're encountering him in the word, his promises. All those things can play into your new song. Now, the thing is, every single person in here can sing a new song. Does everyone believe that? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I don't. It doesn't matter if you're not a sing- I'm not a singer. I'm not a worship leader. I'm not a songwriter. I'm just whatever. Well, first of all, you're not just. But yes, you have a song. You have a new song. Each and every single time that you set your gaze on Jesus, you have a new song in your heart. And it's whether or not you think, t- think to look for it or that you think to release it. All right. <clears throat> The other couple times that a new song is mentioned, there's once in Isaiah, and then we see it in Revelation. Um, So I'll just briefly hit on the one in Revelation, just to give you another perspective of the new song. So um, with the four living creatures, am I getting that right? And the 24 elders, they see Jesus as the lion. But they also see this book that has to be opened, and so they're looking. If I'm wrong, someone fix my memory because it's all over the place. Um, and they look up, and they're like, well, who's worthy to open it? And then they see Jesus as the lamb, who is a sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world, and he alone is worthy to open it. And so from that, after upon them laying eyes on that and seeing that, together in unison, they all sang a new song, is what Revelation tells us. 
And they say, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Which is just so powerful. Like in unison, their new song, that's more kind of like a prophetic <laughs> new song, right? To see something like that. And the Spirit of God is definitely there. That's who it was moving upon their hearts. All right, so how do we sing a new song? If you go to this church, more than likely you have heard the worship leader at some point, um, at, at some point in the worship set say, sing unto God a new song. Or maybe um, sing something to God in your own words. That, that would be another way of saying to sing a new song. Even if you don't go to church here, there's a chance that maybe your church does that or that you've heard that kind of language before. If not, come here and you can experience that sometime. Um, but don't stay here if that's not where you're supposed to be. That's not what I meant. Okay, so be where you're supposed to be from the Lord. Okay, um, so basically, so what we're learning from what a new song is, it's, it should be an overflow of your heart. That's exactly what it should be, which our whole life should be that, right? Our whole life should be worship unto God, not just singing with our voices, but every single step that we take, woof, <laughs> every single word that we speak, every breath that we breathe should be an overflow of our heart of what, of who God is in us and what, what he's done. You know, worship obviously is not something that we should just be doing at church on Sundays. Um, hopefully you worship him like in your car or as you're getting ready for church or um I don't know about you but I feel like sometimes I'll just like put on worship music in my house and it's nice to have some background music some people might just turn on the tv for background noise too and that's fine too but it's like all of a sudden it's just I'll hear what song is being on and I'm just like all of a sudden in wow <laughs> like in awe of who God is and it's like man I'm like stuck in my own place just busy doing my own thing taking care of my home, taking care of my family, thinking about a bajillion other unimportant things. And I'm just like, it's like the Holy Spirit just like taps me on the shoulder, you know, and he's like, hey. And then I have that opportunity to keep going about what I'm doing to be busy, or I can worship him where I'm at. And I can worship him in the song that's being sung, or I can go into a new song in that moment and just stop and meeting, meeting eyes with him. And that's another way to fill up your heart to where it's overflowing. It's not just in your quiet time. It's not just, again, not just at church on Sunday mornings that you get filled up. It's just like in those little pockets during the day that you get to meet eyes of Jesus and be like, well, hello, <laughs> it might've been a while, you know? And then there you are, you're getting filled back up. So when we think about it, again, I've already said it a couple times, but when we sing a new song, it's an overflow. Who is he to Derek? <laughs> Who was he to you this week when you, whenever you're in an opportunity to give him a new song? What did you see him as? You know, if you've been in your word, Tom, like what, did, what jumped out to you in the word? What have you been meditating on? Or, um, you know, one time just recently I heard the speaker and, and they were talking about how you can, we can read our Bible for the mere fact of completion, right, just to mark it off, like I got my Bible time in, or we can come to the Bible for understanding and to meet with God. Like we have that opportunity every single time we open the Word. And so if you're in the Word and you're not in a hurry, I mean, having the Word is better than no Word at all, but if you're not in a hurry and something kind of jumps out to you and you're like, man, I've read that a lot of times and I've never noticed that. What is it? Why is that Word sticking out to me? Or why is that verse sticking out to me? You can meditate on that, and then you can even take it into your new song. I don't know. Has anyone ever done anything like this, or you're like, hmm, this is weird? Um, yeah. Anyone got any thoughts? Why I collect mine. Hymns go through my head all the time. What is? Hymns go through my head all the time. Hymns, yeah. 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 Sometimes I sing and sometimes I just listen to my brain. Yeah, yeah. No, that's so good. Sing them out loud more often. That's my challenge to you. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I've kind of given you a little bit of practical tips on how to sing a new song. Um, so basically that was going to my next point. Sing scripture. If you have nothing else to sing, get in your word and pick. If nothing's highlighted to you, pick something out. <laughs> 
you know? Unless you're in like Leviticus or something singing about the laws, more than likely it's like good stuff. I know. And I'm sure God moves to do mighty ways. Those laws were good for what they had, but um, we have so much opportunity. There's something about song. You know, it's like obviously we're all drawn to music, right? Even non believers <laughs> are attracted to some music. To a lot of music. There's something about that God's put in song. You know, it's taking place in heaven day and night, night and day. Just constant song, constant worship. And that's what we are created for. So everyone has that opportunity, even if you feel like it doesn't come natural to you. It's like, it's like in your DNA. It can be uncovered. It's not just for a certain person. So, it, you know, the singing scripture is also a great way to meditate on the word. It's a great way to memorize it. If you want to start memorizing scripture and you're just kind of having a hard time, make up a melody or use Mary Had a Little Lamb if you need to. You know, just start somewhere. And the more you do it, the more it'll evolve into that new song or become a part of your new song later on. All right. Um... If you feel like you're stuck and you're like, I don't have a melody to sing, even Mary Had a Little Lamb's not clicking, <laughs> find some like instrumental Christian worship music on YouTube. Even if it's set to a song that you already know the words to, but there's no words being sung, you might be surprised at what comes out, at what different melodies come out to you. And just start there. It's a very, very simple place to start. Or... Again, like if you come here, at least I'll just use this for, for an example because it's what I know. I'm hoping that we're going to see more and more in our worship as we get into depth of even more instrumental time. Because there's a lot more room for God to, to move than what we give him sometimes. And um, it's a journey. It's a path. Um, it's something that will just take doing for some people to get used to who aren't used to that. But during those instrumental times, unless you're being instructed to be silent and still before the Lord, and even if they don't say to sing a new song, you can still do it. Worship God. Worship Him with what you have. Worship Him with your spoken words, but worship Him with a song of just, Jesus, you're good. You can say that over and over again. You can sing it over and over again. That is valid. Um, so as far as singing scripture... I bet some of you guys, like hymn-wise or hymns or any other wise, you might be able to recite songs. You're like, I know that scripture. Or maybe you're reading in your Bible and you're like, that's a song that I really like. <laughs> well, hopefully our worship leaders are using the Bible to write their songs. And hopefully that it's not just in concept, but it's in word, right? Um, some song, like a song that we do here sometimes is called Our Father. And it's just the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father... In heaven, hallowed be your name. Right? Does anybody else have any other examples that you can think off the top of your head of? Yeah? Well, I know you mentioned Revelation about the Lamb. And yeah. That always makes me think of, is he worthy? It's by Andrew Peterson. Oh, okay. that whole thing in there about opening the scroll. And I love that yeah. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? I, I mentioned the band last week is Sons of Korah, K O R A H. Okay. They actually sing Psalm 40, so I okay. memorized this psalm because. Oh, of that song. very cool. I, I need to look into them. I wrote it down and then They're I forgot. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Really, really okay, people, look that up if you need some new, <laughs> some new stuff. Um, Shane and Shane. Does anybody know Shane and Shane? They are big on just taking a lot of the psalms mm -hmm. and just putting music to it. It's really good. I don't know if we're going to have time or not, but I might play a little bit. So um, does anybody know of IHOP Kansas City? Yep. Hopefully in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> don't just Google search them, but you can YouTube IHOP Kansas City worship sets. How about that? <laughs> um, so I spent 2004 and 2006 at IHOP Kansas City, and I did an internship there, and then um, I helped to lead the next internship just as a... A uh, small group leader is for kids who are basically 18 to 25, I think it was. And it was just taking six months of our time and pursuing the Lord. And we had classes on, you know, learning about God as the Father and just a whole bunch of stuff. And then we had, there was a, a prayer room that went 24-7, like nonstop. Every two hours, there were teams scheduled in there 
to offer prayer and worship unto the Lord. And so, yes, even in the, at, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., there was a set going on. Um, and the sets were, there was a few different kinds of sets, but one of them, since we're talking about singing the word, was called Worship with the Word. And so um, each team, like I said, had two hours. And so for the Worship with the Word set, the worship leader would get together with a prayer leader, and they would pick out a scripture together. And then... Um, and then the worship leader would also pick out maybe a handful of songs because singing worship songs together unifies people, right? Especially if they're not the first time that it's being done. That's why worship leaders hopefully are not just introducing new songs week after week after week because it's hard to unify in one voice right. when there's a bajillion new songs, right? Which is why sometimes even the simpler songs are the better ones because they're like, oh yeah, I can get that one. Um, so they get a uh, list of worship songs. Then in between, their, in between their, their worship songs, the worship leader would pick maybe a chord progression. So if anybody plays instruments, they'd pick maybe four chords. And they would say, okay, after this worship song, we're going to transition to these four chords. And then the worship um, leader, they just like facilitate just this instrumental time. Then the prayer leader would introduce their verse or their, pas or their passage of scripture. And then there would usually be anywhere from four to six other people on the team who would just sing around those verses. So it's called worship with the word. And so they would literally sing the word. And then they would go off into a new song or into a prophetic song from, from their time with Jesus. I don't know, is that... Is it really cool? Like, really cool. Um, so if we don't get to it today, then one of my favorites, you should write this down if you want an example. Um, and YouTube put in IHOP, so I-H-O-P-K-C, all together. IHOP stands for International House of Prayer, not Pancakes. Yeah. That was like a, they had to go through a settlement to get that cleared up. So IHOP KC. And then Corey Asbury, he's the one who sings Reckless Love, but this was way before he was who he is now. So, um, and then you want to type in Psalm 84. Okay, wait a minute. I hop Casey, Corey Asbury, Psalm 84. Do you have any slashes? No, nope, just put that in the search bar and it'll come up. I've done it a few times lately. C-O-R-Y. And then Asbury, A-S-B-U-R-Y. And then Psalm 84. Yep. It's about, I mean, the version on there, excuse me, is about 10 minutes long. You're not getting the worship song that brought them to that progression, but you'll kind of get an idea. And maybe if you're kind of stuck on how do I sing scripture, not that you have to do it like them because you're not set up as a team, but maybe it was kind of giving you an idea just how to pick out little choruses around what you're looking at to build. But even if you just have it on during your word or during your time doing whatever, just stuff like that is just really good. And they cut it off after 10 minutes, but it went, it went longer in the prayer room. But um, another way that they would, um, one of their other sets was intercession. And so this is where people were invited to come up to the mic, and we've done this at different times in the past, um, to pray a to pray over a topic. Maybe we're praying for the nation of Israel today. They always had a dedicated time spot, at least during once during the day, to pray for Israel. And people were invited to come up and to pray. And then the people on the worship team and their prophetic singers and the worship leader would get the heart of the song and just start singing choruses around their prayers. So it was another way to engage in prayer was through singing it. So it was really cool. Sometimes it was a little hard. Sometimes prayer can feel hard. That's when you get up and move, and you just focus on God's goodness, and hopefully the overflow happens, right? All right, so prophetic new songs. You know, it's different because, like, back in the Old Testament, right, they didn't have the Spirit of God. So they had to sing their new songs based of what was told to them or based off of what they saw. Where we have the Spirit of God living inside of us, Sorry, microphone. If you said yes to Jesus, you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And so your new song can be more prophetic. Hopefully you're hearing from the Holy Spirit. But there's no pressure. It's still, it's your song. It's a song that he's putting on your heart to God. That's what it is. Fresh and anew. 
All right, so I feel like I, I nailed that in pretty good. We got, we got the new song and a couple different ways to go about it, to apply it, to find it, to stir it up. Okay. All right, let's go into... Uh, well, this is just kind of talking about the prophetic a little bit. Let's go in there for just a couple minutes. Will somebody read Colossians 3.16, please? In the New Testament, I'll preface it, Paul divide, told us three different ways that we are to go about our songs. He kind of classified it for us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I don't know, has anyone else ever read that before and been like, Oh, we're supposed to go walk around to one another and just sing to one another? Yeah. I mean, doesn't that sound kind of awkward? <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone do that? And it's okay if you don't. But I, you know, And he mentions it again in Ephesians 19. That there are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and that's how we're supposed to go about. So even Paul is saying, you have a new song with the Holy Spirit. And you should be opening your voice with it often. I mean, I'm guilty of not doing it, like, all the time, you know. But that's not the only avenue. But it is an avenue. I can't see myself walking up to a crowd of people and just breaking out and song and dance. So. Yeah. Just, well, you don't have to dance, Paul said, but oh, oh, I guess right. you well, could. Oh, more have to dance and sing is the whole thing. You know, I Hello. Dance, I might be able to dance, but not sing. Well, you know what I like about this? I wrote in my, my some other time in my column, uh, three times there was thankfulness mentioned in this paragraph. That's good. And it says, and be thankful in the beginning, and then, it may be a different version, it doesn't, but, and then after singing songs of gratitude, and at the, the last sentence it says, giving thanks. And that's a, just a great way to start a prophetic song. Yeah. You know, just in thankfulness. And then when you see people who talk about admonish one another, you know, oh, let me tell you what God's done. I'm so thankful for what he did this week. And, you know, yeah. it may not be a, like a tune, but it's yes. the same idea. You yeah, know? I agree. And maybe stepping out in those, stepping out in that more often and making it more of your intention will stir that that new song, that spiritual prophetic song. And even if it's not to that person, maybe it's just in your own time with the Lord or as you walk away, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, maybe we've limited ourselves because it's just not our common practice. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that looked for Paul walking around. You know, surely he did that, right? If he's yeah. saying it? I don't know. Yeah. All right, so, um, so Carol used this book to teach a few weeks ago. And I didn't even realize that I had it on my bookshelf until a few days ago. And I was like, oh, well, look at that. So it's called The Next Wave, or not the, it's just Next Wave by Bob Sorge. And I'm just going to read a couple little parts about prophetic worship that he had to say. <clears throat> so he's the one in his book who brought to my attention, because I forgot about it, about Colossians 3.16. Um, but he said, and by spiritual songs, Paul meant the spontaneous singing of songs that are moved along by the waves of the Holy Spirit. The words of a spiritual song don't come directly from a scripture or from the lyrics of a composed hymn, but straight from the worshiper's heart as they express their thoughts to Jesus in the moment. Spiritual songs are unpremeditated, spontaneous, extemp I cannot say that word even reading it, and unrehearsed. Spiritual songs can be sung in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterances or can be sung in a person's native tongue. Right? So, I mean, even at church, like at least here, sometimes we just pray in tongues or encourage you, if you have your prayer language, to do that. That's, def that's definitely a spiritual song, right? <laughs> and yeah, that maybe that's something you don't walk up to someone and just start singing in tongues over them. Um, they might be praying for you in return or running, but um, yeah, that's another way. Um, I'm going to read you one more part from his book, and it's a few pages later, and he talks about prophetic worship. So he said, as far as the prophetic flow in worship goes, more specifically, David and his military cabinet appointed musical Levites who should prophesy with harps, string instruments, and cymbals, which is found in um, 1 Chronicles 25.1. The passage says they were the ones who prophesied with a harp to give thanks 
and to praise the Lord. Their thanks and praise flowed like inspired oracles. Um, so how does, well, I'll, I'll read it in order. So he says, were they prophesying while musical instruments were being played? Or was the very playing of their instruments an expression of prophecy? Both. They sang prophecies, and they also prophesied upon their instruments. Musicians can prophesy, therefore, with their voices and also with their instruments. How does prophesying on an instrument work? When musicians are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, they can play their instrument in a way that opens the hearts of the congregation to more of God. An anointed musical interlude played spontaneously in the spirit at a strategic moment can sometimes carry more impact than spoken or sung words. Have you ever felt that? I know, right? Have you ever felt that during a worship? I mean, like sometimes Josh will just go on the keys and you're like, there it is. And you don't even, we don't need to sing. And sometimes as a worship leader, that can be one of the hardest struggles in our brains while we're up there is feeling like we have to not entertain, but like we have to fill the space with our words and sing. Because if we don't, what if the people are uncomfortable? Well, you know what? The Holy Spirit is the comforter, but to meet him, it means getting uncomfortable sometimes. And so there is a place. And that's what I was talking about earlier. I think, I think we're going to step into this more. Um, I'm just believing it across the board, like in the church as a, lar as a whole. But even here specifically at PAG, I think as we go deeper in worship, we're going to see even more and more of those times of just waiting on the Lord and letting the instruments prophesy, letting God use the hands and the skills and the minds of our musicians to take us into deeper places with God. Now, as always, us who are not on the worship team in that given moment have the choice to enter in. We have a choice to submit to the Holy Spirit. We have a choice to participate. Or we can just stay in the outer courts. Spectate. Yeah, we can spectate. I, I, think, I, have a, I think I'm missing out. Yeah? Because in those moments, I think, I mean, I'm thinking of a few times where maybe I'm groaning and I can't say words like with the presence, but I think most of those times I end up singing in my head instead of just letting the mm. music do that so I might be missing out I might have to try to just quiet my thoughts because and those are the moments where I was just I'm like Jesus you're so beautiful and yeah. I'm like doing my own thing and not yeah. letting the the, the the worship come through the, uh, I'm gonna have to try that all right yeah huh. that's good I and I feel I feel that tension even when I'm not leading worship even when I'm maybe I'm um, just one of the other singers or maybe I'm just down with everyone else, I feel that tension sometimes of do I do I keep worshiping? And sometimes we listen. We should listen to the worship leader for that to give us cues and clues of what to do. But sometimes it's just being discerning and asking God. Especially, I think, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit. But one way to to focus and to connect with God to get outside of all the distractions is to express our love to Him. Right, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And it kind of gets all the other things out of the way and just focuses us, us on him. But I think once we're focused, that's when we ask. Or that's where we stay discerning. Um, and no, maybe I just sit here yeah. and just bask in it. Or maybe I get low to the ground and just wait on him. But again, even though I'm talking about the new song and singing a lot, there are depths to be had just with waiting on the Lord. But it comes through corporate worship and through the pathway of worship. So yeah, that's good. I'm challenged you. So um, I haven't read all this, but, but Carol taught off the first half. So if you liked her class, it's a good book. I liked it, Carol. I just want to start singing some of those 90s stuff. Ron Cannoli, I'm like, woo, take me back 30 years. You know, you know. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, so let's get into the Holy of Holy intimacy, both in worship and just in our relationship. Does anybody have anything before I move on? Questions, comments? All right. Okay, so Holy of Holies intimacy. This freaks some people out. Some people could just live here, and some people are like, hmm, <laughs> intimacy, hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Oliver's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Just kidding, Oliver. All right. So, 
intimacy. We have been invited in. Obviously, when we read our Bible, there's a whole lot of people who did not have that access to God, into the Holy of Holies. So, anyways, we know about the priest, right? Let's go on to that in a minute. So let's just recap a little bit of what Christy talked about last week for those of you who are here. The pathway of worship, where does it start? If you're looking at the temple, if we're talking about the pathways of the temple. Huh? In the outer court. Yeah, in the outer courts. And what happens in the outer courts? You're singing you're and dancing. You're distracted. Yeah, she talked about how a lot of times we come in distracted, right? Unless you've already been here and you kind of got all your thoughts out, whatever, you're distracted when you come in. But that's why it's such a great place, too, to start wakening your spirit up and connecting your mind with your spirit through celebration and thanksgiving. That's what's supposed to be happening at the outer courts, right? It's like a celebration. Uh, where do we go next? Can I say yeah. We move on? Sure. I have, when I've been here for a prayer before service, mm-hmm. I can get rid of those distractions. Yes. And it, I think it's easier to move in to the holy place. Mm-hmm. Um, last Sunday, I was in the holy of holies. Amen. Uh, I could hear nothing going on around me. It was just me and God. Awesome. But I've, I've not experienced that in the depth that I experienced last Sunday. And I think that was the result of Christy teaching. Yeah, yeah, it does help. I but agree. prayer really helps get you focused on worshiping during the service. Yes. I want to add in there that yes, that, that teaching of Christy's made me get there last, on Sunday also, that I hadn't been there yet, and wow. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, there's a, there's a point to our worship, obviously many points, but even the way that, that a lot of worship sets are structured, and not that we have to stay to a formula, but when you start in the outer courts, it's because, yeah, when you're just coming in to the church, like after getting your kids ready or cooking for someone or, you know, X, Y, and Z, just driving here, walking here, there's just a lot going on, right? And so we usually start out the songs to get, to get our mind like, okay, this is where we're at. And so let's celebrate. Let's, let's testify of God's goodness, right? And then next we go to the holy place. So you're going beyond the outer courts. And we're starting to shift our focus even more on God. So sometimes we still sing, most of our worship songs are this way. We sing a lot about us and God in, in, the, in that place. And so it's still, it's still a way of testimony, but it's starting to get more focused, more tuned in to leading to just God for who he is. Does that make sense? And so sometimes, a lot of times, the tempo kind of starts to, to drop a little bit, right? And it gets a little bit more worshipful instead of just praise. Yeah. yeah. Not no more of what he did for me. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're still right. kind of in that place, right. but, but hopefully we're kind of working. We want to work our way to the throne room. Now, um, if you don't understand the pathway as a worship leader, it can be easy for us to leave people there in the holy place. And a lot of our worship songs, even that are um, on the radio or that we stream or that we listen to, however you listen to music, can leave us in the holy place, like a majority of them do. And that's not a bad place to be. <laughs> you know, it's better than, than just being in the outer courts or not being anywhere at all. But, but we fall short if we stay there all the time. And so, where do we go after the holy place? Holy the holy of holies, the inner courts, like the inner of the inner courts. Mm-hmm. And so, this is where our focus is on God alone. I, me, us, we should not be mentioned in our worship songs, in my opinion. <laughs> and Christy taught it too, when we are in the holy of holies. When you are in the holy of holies, you are face to face with God, right? But your intention is on that. It's not just like, oh, yeah, like I'm living this life of Jesus. It's like, no, I am focused on him, on him alone. And if you were imagine if you were actually in his throne room, like, like the physical throne room, do you think you're going to be talking about yourself? No. His holiness is great. <laughs> it's like, it's unsearchable. It's beyond, beyond comprehension. It's overwhelming, I'm sure. Oh, my gosh, I'm a puddle a lot, and I'm not even like, I mean, 
you know, there's, we have access to the throne room here, but you know what I mean? Like when we're in heaven, like holy night. And so that's what I think we need to go into. That's the, that should be our, that should be the place that we desire to be because there is no greater place when we get ourselves completely out of the way and just give him what he's due. He is worthy, right? We sing that, but there's so much meaning in that. He is worthy of every single thing, like every breath, every thought. And he's so good and patient and forgiving and loving and crazy, gracious and compassionate. <laughs> you know, like who are we that he loves us so much? But we have that place. Um, so this is where we get to know him greatly as in the Holy of Holies. This is where, this is where your life can be transformed in a second is the Holy of Holies. It's not you asking God, God, please heal me. God, tell, you know, please deliver me again. Pray those things if you need it. I'm not saying don't pray it. I'm just saying when you're in the throne room, you don't have to ask. And even other times, there's times that he just does things that you don't have to ask. But, but does that make sense? And, and that's why I think, I don't know if you guys have ever heard testimonies, but I've heard stories of people who are worshiping God did not ask for healing, did not go up to an altar call to receive healing, and they're healed in an instant. Mm -hmm. And because they were focused on God. They weren't focused on themselves. They weren't focused on how they looked during worship, how they sounded to their neighbor. They weren't thinking about lunch. They weren't, I mean, at one point, they probably were a few seconds before that. But you know what I mean? Like, they were in the Holy of Holies. They were meeting with Jesus. And that's where transformation happens. So I think we kind of talked about it a little bit last week and in times past, but, you know, it's like back in the Old Testament, the priests were the only ones who got to go into the holies of holies. And they went in there once a year, from my understanding, to make atonement, right? To, to offer the sacrifice. To be, and it was basically a band-aid, but that's all that they had until Jesus came, right? And in order to be that priest was a very high, sacred, um, I mean, it was a thing of reverence. I don't know if I would have wanted to be that priest. I mean, there are so many like, like ritual cleansings and different things that they had to do to prep themselves so that they wouldn't just die in the presence of God as soon as they went into the Holy of Holies. It was a, beyond serious. To have that position and know you did something wrong, but yet it was your time to go in, and you're like, no, wait, I can't throw this out. I know, right? You know what I mean? That'd be or you're terrible. like quadrupling, checking, did I do this, right? Did I do that, right? Did I stay in the water long enough? Did right. I, no, I are my linens completely not. clean? Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, it's a very big deal. Um, what? Yeah, I know, right? All that stuff. Um, we see about in, in Leviticus 10, when, when all this was being set up and the temple was being set up and they were given the laws and all that stuff of, of how the priests were supposed to do all this. And Aaron's son, Aaron, Moses' brother, two of his sons did the wrong thing. They, they definitely screwed up. They offered something to God that he did not ask. And they died. They were consumed with fire from the altar, if I remember right. And that's it. And then uh, Aaron's other two sons had to take their burnt bodies away. Now, if that doesn't well, put the fear of God in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if that doesn't put the fear of God in you, being those brothers, like, oh, cool, I get to go next. Oh, yay. <laughs> I was even thinking even just to go get their bodies, I'd be like, oh, geez. Well, they didn't have Jesus, but you know. Anyways. I just had to pull them out. Yeah, I don't know. It's that they had to get their bodies. I don't know. I don't know if it was before all that really happened, oh. where they had the ropes on them. It kind of just made Maybe it sound made like. Them think about what <laughs> P.S. Let's start adding ropes to the ankle <laughs> and bells, so if we hear nothing. We know. Yeah, I don't know. If, I mean, that was funny. I don't know if we should laugh. Um, <laughs> so. I, I say all that just to give us, again, perspective of what we have access to now to get to go into the Holy of Holies, right? Because we get to know God intimately that so many people for a lot of years didn't have access to. And even a lot of people, and even us sometimes, are walking around not remembering what we have access to. But in order to reach the Holy of Holies, we need a great understanding of who God is and who we are in him. What did Jesus do for you? If you don't have any kind of revelation for that, 
it's going to be harder to really step into the Holy of Holies. And so I don't say that in a condemning way. I just say, if you still don't really have an idea of your identity or of how holy he really is, that he's worth all of that, then ask him for more. Ask him for a greater revelation of the cross. He wants to give it to you. He loves when you come close. Like, loves it. Like, way more. Like, I love being there. But it's not always the easiest thing to enter in, right? Yeah. But he is so, again, good. <laughs> and he loves when we take those extra steps, even when we don't feel like it, even when it's hard to get closer and closer and to enter into the Holy of Holies. And it's not just so he can, like, boost his ego, like, yeah, I'm holy, yeah, I'm worthy. It's like he loves spending time. He loves when we have a greater revelation. And when we're walking in that, the enemy, his power is like, <laughs> it's not it's not existent in the moment, right? Um, something that Darlene Sheck said, um, she said, learn to seek his face without worrying about saving yours. I'm just as guilty, even as a worship leader, who can sometimes step outside of the box on a worship set on the stage. Sometimes, like when I come in, <laughs> too, and I'm not up there, and I'm not as warmed up, and I'm distracted, I can find myself kind of worrying, like, I don't want to say worrying, but I feel like I should bow. But should I bow? You know what I mean? Like, who's around? Like, oh, I'm too close to this person. Like, I need to, like, go get some space somewhere, you know? Um, but it shouldn't be about us at all. <laughs> There's somebody at our church that I love so much, and I'm not going to say their name. They sing so loud. It is kind of distracting. But I know that it comes from a pure heart that they are giving God every single yeah. thing that they have. They don't have the greatest voice, but they are giving God their whole heart. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. And sometimes it's, it's like distracting, but also I want to be near that person. I want to worship them with all that I have, you know? That can be contagious. It's good. So be that person. Let's be those people. Um, there's a sacrifice that, that takes place in our hearts to enter into the Holy of Holies in worship. So again, maybe it is bowing low. Maybe, so if, if you're on that path to worship and you're past the outer courts, you decided, I'm going to go beyond the holy place. And as, as a body, we're all going there together. And I want to participate in that. Then... If God tells you, if you kind of have that tug on your heart, and God is so gentle. You know, again, he's not usually loud when he talks to you. Usually it's the enemy that's loud, so that's how you know. So, yeah, it's, yeah. So, but usually it's like a quiet tug of like, lift your hands. Not, or maybe lift your hands higher. Or maybe get on your knees. And it's like, well, that's not comfortable. Or the person next to me, you know, kind of peeking in your eyes. If you have your eyes closed, you're peeking. Well, they're not doing it. It doesn't matter. Obedience matters. And so God still loves you if you choose not to do that. You can totally choose not to, and he will still love you with crazy love. But you're missing out yes. if you don't. It's an act of surrender, and it's an act of submission. You don't have to sing about surrender. You do it. And that is a place where you, when you move outside of your comfort zone, you're recognizing his holiness that is in front of you. And you're saying, I recognize you. <laughs> and again, you're, you're worth my comfort. You're worth my ability to want to feel like I'm staying safe. If you can't move, maybe you want to be on your knees, but you just can't. There's no condemnation. God's not going to ask you to do something that you can't do. But he might be calling you in other ways to step outside of your comfort. Maybe it is singing loud like the person I'm talking about. Maybe it's stepping outside of your seat and just going to worship by someone else or worshiping by yourself. If, again, I'm talking about here because this is where I go to church, but wherever you go to church, I know at least here, we have a side on the right and a side on the left that is spacious. You have so much room to worship over there. You can wave your arms around if God's telling you to wave your arms around and be a crazy person and you won't hit anyone in the face. You don't have to worry about your neighbor. So if God's calling you to do it, you step out and you do it. I love not worshiping next to people. I know that sounds wrong, but I just, I'm an arm mover. That's what I do. But if I'm next to someone, I feel like ooh, constricted. So maybe I need to get over that. There's probably times I just need to stay in my seat. But anyways, or we have like the front. You can go to the front. Some people do that. And it is not fun walking up there. But I guarantee you, no one else really cares. No, no one cares. I never care when I see someone walk up there. But when I feel like I'm supposed to, I'm like, I usually wait another, an extra minute than I, <laughs> than I should. Because I'm like, okay. 
okay, I'm gonna, okay, I know I want to. I want to give you all I have. Okay, I'm going to do it. And then it's like another minute, and finally I just do it, you know? And then when you get up, you're like, dang it, I have to get up and walk back, you know? Should I do it now, or should I wait till they're done praying? You know, like, these are like real-life thoughts in my brain. So maybe I'm the only one. But if I'm not the only one, then you're not alone, okay? Some of my favorite things was we, we went to a church where this guy was coming for a long time, and he would go to the front and he would box. Wow! He was, like, dancing, and he would just <clears throat> and he would like <laughs> air boxing. And it was him? like yeah. so. I wonder if he did Tai Bo. Maybe that's how he met with Jesus <laughs> in his home. Big in the MMA. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he was a heavy metal guy, and so yeah, I mean he was. And then I went he to was another, fighting somebody. And another <laughs> church, and there was um, a guy. It was a Pentecostal church, and there was a guy that roared. Wow. And that was like, at first I was like, maybe I should leave. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. The more I saw him and his character, and he got to know him a little bit better. And yeah. when he would do it, you would, it was just. You couldn't help but be in all of it. Yeah. Yeah. They're being undignified in their worship. I mean, to me, that's what it seems like. You know what I mean? I love Sunday, that, that how much pastor was getting around, because it's, it's, it's contagious a little bit, you know? And, yeah. and I think his son-in-law would start jumping, and pastor would start jumping, or vice versa. And they were definitely, there was the same spirit moving throughout. Mm. And it's just like you said, I think... It's not singing about surrender. It's just surrendering to Yeah. Them. She's got a great story when she first got saved about flags. And she was mm. like laughing at the person a little bit in her spirit about I've someone waving it. a flag. Yeah, And then sure. God told her that same service, go get a flag and wave it for me. Yes. He said, that's my daughter. And mm. she waves that flag for me. Get up and get a flag. Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you did it right away at first, right? Yeah. No, I did. Yeah. I got it because it was the dad voice. Yeah, <laughs> the dad voice. God the Father has got his dad voice. You can do it. <laughs> I know we haven't really done flags here in a long time, and Carrie brought it out well, like a month ago or something, and I was just like, and I was a mess. It was like something so powerful. I forgot about it until you mentioned that, and I just, I think it's just that call of like, there is more to me, and to you it might just look like a flag, but what it does in the spiritual is beyond your comprehension, which is why we should do all things with obedience unto God in worship and outside of worship. But again, our whole life should be worship, right? Yeah. So even when I'm saying, maybe God's calling you this next Sunday morning, I'm not pointing to you, I'm sorry, Lori, <laughs> you <laughs> to be like a crazy arm worshiper. You don't know what you're clearing out in the spirit by doing well, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah Lori. That's the first time I ever was, like, I felt over. Mm. Was I, I, I did the act of obedience when he said to go do it, and I went back to my seat and just whoop, went yeah. right, right into my seat. And yeah. I was like, I didn't even know that was real. <laughs> it was very memorable. It made an impression, right? And it took you to new places. Yeah, yeah it's so good. Um, <clears throat> let me see. With, I, we only have a few minutes left, so let me see where I want to take us here. I'm just going to take us real quick through, um, <clears throat> does anybody know John Eldridge? Yeah. yeah, he's got good stuff. Yeah, Resilient, have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. Oh man, so good. Write this down if you, if you need another book. Some of you are probably like, I have a million I haven't read yet. But this one, um, it came out I think like last December, wait, December of 2022 or maybe January. I think it's December. Anyways, 2022. Um, it's just so good. I can't recommend it enough. It's something that I keep on my bed stand, and sometimes I just go back to one or two certain chapters over and over again throughout the year. Resilient. Who's the author? John Eldridge. There's no eyes in Eldridge. It's all ease. I know. I do it too. That's why I said it. I don't know. I know he's mainly based in Colorado, but he could have been up there. I don't know. He's got a lot of books like Wild at Heart and. I don't know, different. He's been around for quite a while. I think he's like a psychologist or some kind of therapist and a Christian, so that's how he teaches. Um, so real quick, something that stuck with me through this book is called The Deep Well Inside of Us. That's one of his chapters. 
And it, it basically, he's talking about our relationship with God and <clears throat> how there's three layers to our being. So the first layer is called the shallows. That's what he calls it. The shallows is where we spend 99% of our time, if you really think about all of your thoughts. The shallows are characterized and ruled by the distractions of life. In the shallows, we flit from thought to thought and from distraction to distraction. More than ever, we are distracted as a culture and as a people. <laughs> so, the shallows. The midlands are characterized and ruled by the cares of life, that, of such as like the cares of life of what Jesus talked about in Matthew. But basically, those are our deeper worries, our heartaches, our longings and aspirations that occupy the human heart. They're, they're, they're weightier matters. You know, they're, they're those things that maybe you know so-and-so who just got cancer, like, like that kind of stuff that you're just like, you, you feel the weight of it. And then the third place, which is where most of us don't go, but we need to learn, and he kind of teaches you how to get to this place, it's called the depths. Go figure. Good, the depths. So it's deeper than the other two places, and it's characterized and ruled by eternal things like faith, hope, love, joy, but the trueness of them, not weighted down. The essence of our existence, so this is the, the essence of our existence and the dwelling place of God who lives, who lives in us when we invited him into our hearts and made us Lord and Savior. So this is, a, this is basically like, like, like the inner courts in worship. Like you are meeting with God. If you believe that he dwells inside of you, this is you fully meeting him, him, with him there. There's no distractions. There's no, no thoughts weighing you down. Like you are focused on him. But he talks about how it takes practice to get there. It means releasing, even if you have to release it over and over. Like you're intentionally setting apart time to meet with God, not to keep yapping your mouth and not to keep apologizing for what you've done wrong and not help, help, help me and help, help, help them. But you are solely meeting to, you know, j just to meet with him. But how much comes out of that? And then he talks about, um, it's, he said, like, the best way to start getting there, it begins with simply giving him your attention. Because so many things are vying for our attention, right? And all he wants is a glance. Have any of you guys met with Jesus with just a glance? You're like, oh, I actually looked at you, and there you are. You were waiting for me. <laughs> like, so many times. So he said, set a time. Set aside a time to give God your undivided attention because the battle is always over your attention. And the new thought is that we are going to give our attention to the God who lives within us. Finding God always begins with loving him. So settle in. This takes time and practice to turn your focus to him. But one of the best ways to get there is just repeating, God, I love you. God, I love you. When a worry comes up, when a distraction comes up, God, I give this person and I give that situation to you. God, I love you. I love you. So another thought comes up. God, I give this person in this situation to you. God, I love you. I love you. But you do it slow. You don't have to like speed say it. You know, you're saying it slow and you're being intentional and you will meet with him. Um, and then he also talks about once we are accustomed to it, we can practice going deeper just about anywhere we are. It becomes easier to get to that place once you've practiced it. And I can totally, I, you know, even I can testify about that for myself. You know, as a, as a new mom, I felt like I never had time to be in the Word when Judah was like a baby or to, to do how I thought my quiet time should be. But as soon as I was in the car and as soon as I, like, put my eyes on Jesus, even in a second, he met me with the cr most crazy amount of grace. And just filled my, whatever I was driving at the time with his presence that I was just like a mess every single time I was in my car. Because that was the time that I had to just focus on him. I was looking at the road too. I was going to say that's not safe. I was. Actually. Well, Jesus take the wheel. Isn't that like a song or something like that? Wow. Yeah, he protects you. And so, anyways, if you want to learn more about that, the whole book is not just on that. It's basically about our, our call to want to like return to Eden where everything is good. And COVID totally smacked us in the face and made us feel farther away from that than ever. And this is about how to be resilient. So anyways, um, so we're out of time. I had a little bit left to do, but we're out. But um, I don't know, did anybody feel like they kind of got a better understanding or maybe a, a challenge from the Holy Spirit or something about going deeper into the Holy of Holies? Yeah, yeah very good. Good. All right, well, I will pray us out. And um, for those of you who aren't sure your place in the Holy of Holies, write down Hebrews 10. 19 through 22. Let's just read that real fast and then we'll end on that. Hebrews 19 through 22.
No, Hebrews 10. I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. If anybody has it, you can read it. If not, I'll read it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living by a new and living way opened up for us through this curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance mm -hmm. that brings uh, that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So this is just one of the many scriptures that, that we can look at and be like, this is why I have access. Mm -hmm. Jesus died on the cross. He came as, as priest for me, as a sacrifice for me. And now he tells me that I can come confidently and boldly before his throne to worship him, to spend time with him, to let my whole life flow out of that place. So again, if you're not sure how to get to the Holy of Holies, start meditating on that exact verse right there and ask Jesus for a greater revelation because he wants to give it to you. All right, I'll pray us out. All right, well, Jesus, thank you so much that you made a way for us that you paid the highest price so that we could be with you. God, I pray for every single person in here and every single person listening, God, that they, um, that they would set their gaze and their affection and their intention to meet with you in even greater ways, and that that would be the prayer of their heart. God, I pray that they would find themselves walking around their homes and their cars, um, wherever they go, just singing new songs. Or if they're at church, God, that they would be Challenge to get outside of their comfort zone to meet with you in greater ways. And that new songs would flow from that place, that, that an obedient heart that loves you would come from that place, and that they would know your love in greater and mightier ways, all for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Is there a next Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a new series. Okay. I can't remember what it is, but yes. Hey. Yeah. I wanted to email you just one song and that I won't send you. Sure. <laughs> okay. It's, I'm not worried about it. I know. It. It's all the last thing you need is one more song. No, I love new songs. I'll get this out of the way. I'm just okay, thank you. Here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Just that. Oops. Sorry.
like it. She was learning. I've been oh, those are fun. Wow, <laughs> 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 I like it. It wasn't so slow. <laughs> Let's try. Right. Yeah, I won't get anything in. That was like.